Energy Switch is the popular point counterpoint show where two leading experts with different perspectives discuss the most pressing energy and climate issues in the news today. Next on Energy Switch, we'll look at the changing geopolitics of energy. Funding for Energy Switch was provided in part by Microsoft and the University of Texas at Austin. Different nations have different energy supplies and demands, and this impacts geopolitics. Rising U.S. oil production has changed our relations with Middle Eastern and other countries. Differing emissions reduction goals sometimes pit countries with mature energy systems against those who are still developing. Across all nations, the energy mix is evolving. I'll talk about all this with two world-leading experts. Dr. Ernie Moniz is a nuclear physicist who served as U.S. Secretary of Energy, directed the MIT Energy Initiative, and now leads the Energy Futures Initiative. We can have very, very low greenhouse gas emissions, CO2 emissions, and provide reliable, resilient power. But every tool in the toolbox has to be used and will be used unless we put up artificial barriers in different ways in different regions. Joining him is Dan Jurgen, the Pulitzer Prize winning author of The Prize, The Quest, and The New Map, he is also vice chairman of SP Global, a leading information service provider. Around 2015, 2016, things changed in the relationship between the US and China geopolitically. It's changed in China. They talk about what they call unilateralism or great power hegemony that they're rebelling against. It's sort of almost becoming one system against another. I'm Scott Tinker, and I'm an energy scientist. On this episode of Energy Switch, the new geopolitics of energy. Let's just jump right into it. U.S. oil industry has done pretty well in the last few years. What's that doing to change our position globally? It's changed the economic position of the United States. It's changed the balance of payments of the United States. It's saved maybe $400 billion a year. And it's given the United States a new degree of influence and a different dimension of influence in the world that it didn't have before. Yeah. I would just add that it's also clearly changed the dynamic uh, of the other oil producing countries in, in, in the Middle East. Uh, so it's a, I agree with Dan, this is certainly a big change in the uh, uh, geopolitical dynamic. Right. Not so many years ago, we were importing 60% of our oil. Today, we are the world's largest producer of oil. It's now the big three, yeah. United States, Saudi Arabia, yeah. and Russia. Mm -hmm. what, could, uh, what could change it? I mean, double oil production in less than 10 years, probably one of the fastest changes in energy terms we've seen. The fastest yeah. in history in for history. oil. So what could change that? What, what are the dynamics there? And could we go right back down? <laughs> Well, I think the, uh, the big wild card is going to be the pace of decarbonization of the economy. Uh, I believe that there is no doubt that uh, the energy economy uh, globally is headed towards low carbon. Whether it's uh, net zero uh, by some date definite or not, we are heading that direction. When that begins to bite in terms of oil demand, then we're going to see another reshifting, I think, of the, of the, of the dynamic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that the um, world oil demand is going to continue to increase probably into the world early uh, 2030s. So I think that for the next several years, unless something really surprising happens, the U.S. remains at the forefront among the top producers. But then uh, come the time when demand starts to shrink uh, as, the, as the energy mix shifts, then I think you'll see uh, there's some expectation on the part of some of the major exporters in the Middle East and elsewhere that they will be the ones who will actually gain market share. So, mm -hmm. you know, beyond 10 years, it, the, it, yeah. as often happens, it's, it, the outlook is murky. Sure. Yeah, that, that's exactly the yeah. dynamic that I would envision as well. Yeah. But I would add also one other feature, and that's on the end-use side, the fuels market. Mm -hmm. That is today, you know, Essentially, we can talk about different uh, slates coming out of a refinery, but it's all petroleum-based fuels in effect. Uh, whereas as we go forward, we'll have everything from electrons for light-duty vehicles, there may be hydrogen for Some fuel cells. heavy trucks, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, et cetera. Yeah. So I think that one of the big challenges in the oil and gas sector is going to be a business model that recognizes there's going to be many, many different services required uh, for what today is 
served almost exclusively by, uh, by petroleum. Right, right. How has our growth here changed that dynamic in the Middle East, and what's the significance? You wrote about this way back in the prize. I mean, you, you taught us all about some of these things with that dynamic, and how do you see that changing? Well, I think it, it is changing. I mean, whether uh, consciously or unconsciously, I heard a, you know, a, a prominent sort of moderate U.S. Democratic senators say the other day, we should right-size our commitment to the Middle East. Well, he wouldn't be saying that whether he recognizes it or not if we were importing lots of oil from mm -hmm. the Middle East. And I think the producers in the region sort of see the U.S. becoming less engaged, uh, something that got lost here. But this peace treaty between the United Arab Emirates and Israel that has recently happened, it's a really big deal. And I think there are many reasons for it, but one of the reasons is they're both saying, well, you know, the U.S. may just be less involved in the Middle East, and we have to find our own security solutions. So that's an example of the impact. That's interesting. Yeah. What one is seeing, Saudi Arabia, the Emirates, and others in that region, really looking at this question of, shall we say, evolved business models. Uh, clearly, they are so dependent on oil revenue uh, that they, are, they clearly have to uh, look forward to uh, economic diversification. But the diversification, and particularly if you look at uh, Abu Dhabi, which is part of the United Arab Emirates, they've done a remarkable job. Uh, they were most, almost entirely dependent upon uh, oil for their GDP at the beginning of the century. Now more of their GDP comes from non-oil. And so they have had a very concentrated program of being in other things like semiconductors and uh, advanced materials. Tourism. <laughs> yeah, and tourism. And tourism, right. And yeah. also uh, they're out there with a major carbon capture and sequestration projects. Yes. Uh, and also one sees in the region looking at hydrogen uh, as a way of providing some of those disaggregated fuel services I, I referred to, right. to earlier. Uh, well, they're doing it. Uh, they're, they're getting into the business of ammonia exports uh, to, to Northeast yeah, Asia, yeah, yeah. for yeah. example. Uh, so it, it, I, I think uh, one has to give them credit for really being out there. Frankly, uh, I have to say I, I wish uh, more of our American companies were being as aggressive in terms of uh, thinking how business models need to evolve. I spoke to the government of Oman earlier this year, and it's kind of along the lines you're talking about. Just. A couple thoughts on China in this whole scene. Well, uh, I how do you see that and come to you? I think it's been a dramatic change in U.S. relations with China. If you look at the last uh, national security statement from the Obama administration in 2015, it talked about engagement, constructive relationship. Fast forward to the first national security statement from the Biden administration. It's strategic rival. It's great power competition. And it's the same people from one administration to another. So it, it, this was not just about Donald Trump. Around 2015, 2016, things changed in the relationship between the U.S. and China geopolitically. It's changed in China. They say the same thing. They talk about what they call unilateralism or great power hegemony that they're rebelling against. Uh, it's sort of almost becoming one system against another. And yet at the same time, we're really tightly engaged. 42% of all the containers that come into the United States sure. come from China. So, uh, and this has a lot of energy ramifications to it. So, and including on existing energy sources and on the uh, net zero uh, energy resources. Mm -hmm. Solar costs have come down dramatically, really dramatically. Uh, one big reason is because of the vast scale of Chinese manufacturing, which has driven everybody else out. Like over 80% of solar panels are from China or Chinese controlled companies. So um, there's a new geopolitical angle to uh, this new energy world that we're moving into. What I'm hearing from more and more people in developing countries is a sense that we have a new north-south divide with the north being Western Europe and the United States and Canada telling them how to run their energy systems. And they saying, well, you know, you can't impose your model of an energy transition on us. We'd need a different one. We need to use natural gas because we need to get solid, uh, reliable uh, electricity to people. The 1.1 billion people in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, if you just take out South Africa, generate 50% less electricity than the 29 million people, 29 million people who live in the state of Texas. So that disparity is huge. And uh, 
they need capital to develop, so they need to go down multiple paths. Mm -hmm. The biggest problem in, in this electricity access equation uh, is actually, roughly speaking, the last mile. The, the, the distribution of, of electricity is uh, in very, 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 very bad shape. Um, uh, those companies are almost all essentially bankrupt. Uh, so there's a lot of, a lot of work uh, need, needs to be done here. I'll also note that, you know, we emphasize population growth uh, quite appropriately and, you know, expecting, say, 10 billion people by, by mid-century. So another two plus billion uh, people. What we don't emphasize, in my view, enough in this energy context is that net those additional two and a half billion people are all going to be in cities. We passed 50% urbanization by the UN definitions early in this century. We're going to be at 70% urbanization uh, in 2050. Well, and that means more electricity, more energy and, needs. Yep. And it provides, it, there's risk, but there's also opportunity. There is. Uh, there can be more electrification, for example. Urbanization is something we need to focus on and really bring uh, energy delivery in that urban context. Yep. But Scott, I think still where we are today, the World Health Organization has said that uh, the biggest environmental problem in the world today is indoor air pollution, which comes from cooking with wood, uh, animal crop waste, charcoal and so forth. And the number they put on it is something like close to 3 billion people, which is like 35, 40% of world population. So while well, that last mile electrification, but for a lot of people, it's also getting them, you know, propane and so that they can cook with propane rather than with those waste products. That's why, you know, in India, you see that there's a big focus on, yes, we're going to build wind and renewable. We're also going to use commercial energy, particularly natural gas, big $75 billion program to build a natural gas system because we got to address those indoor pollution Absolutely. questions. And India exports gas to Nepal, where we filmed, to address exactly that thing. So they bring natural gas in as LPG and, and, and using it for cleaner indoor cooking. Gas isn't the villain. <laughs> right. Know? No, gas yeah. is a savior for people. It saves right. their life. It saves their health. I think another enormous factor uh, that comes into the need to address that is what it can mean for freeing up women and having them become much, you know, productive members of the economy and uh, not rather spend all day gathering firewood yeah, and water, et cetera, the, and water. Uh, so, ending the drudgery. And so these things ripple through the entire social structure and, uh, and, and are going and to be central why, to development. And that's absolutely. why, for, you know, what you hear in these developing countries, they have such a different perspective on what the energy agenda is. Mm. What I hear is that, you know, the Netherlands or Germany, these are rich countries. Yes. Uh, we're in a very different state, and you can't impose your solutions on us when we have also imperatives of reducing poverty, imperatives of economic growth, improving health. We've got to do all those things, or by the way, our governments don't survive. How does the U.S., and how do we invest so that they right. can grow with true options? What is our best place dollar? What's the best way to do that, to, in, to, to see these emerging economies build themselves. And I think it's a question of maybe not the best dollar, but diverse dollars. And it's, and it's having the finance flow. And it's not just what the governments do. It is the flow of capital from banks and getting the right criteria. That's right. Bottom line is I think we're going to need uh, policies in the wealthy countries uh, that provide risk mitigation uh, on, on finance. I mean, that's, that's the bottom line with... Um, traction in that area, there are going to be plenty of opportunities to do good and do well. <laughs> but they're going to have to provide risk mitigation up front uh, to get but, that I mean, really your problem. But let, let's get practical here. Yeah. If you're a bank, yeah. on the one hand, you have an emerging market business, a big one, it's important to you, you really want to develop that, support those economies. Your problem over here is your regulators are saying, well, you really shouldn't be investing, supporting mm -hmm. natural gas development there because our policies here are not to support that. The banks themselves are caught in the middle here. So that is a, a, a non-financial non barrier to the flow of finance. And that's where uh, we have to, we, the, the wealthy countries, 
uh, have got to face up to the need uh, to sensibly invest uh, in these countries in order to accomplish the dual purposes of economic development plus the low carbon transition. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not gonna happen just by itself. We've talked about the developed world, the developing world. Let's look to the future. How are we gonna actually address this dual challenge of energy and the environment? Ernie, let's start with you. You've done a lot of thinking on this. And, and how does this happen globally in a way that we're collaboratively moving forward? Well, I think um, publics uh, around the world, including in the United States, have moved dramatically in a short time towards recognizing and supporting the need for action. Uh, and let's face it, the main driver, certainly in this country, uh, is weird weather. Uh, you know, more intense consequences of hurricanes and f wildfires and droughts and floods, and we could go on. Uh, in less wealthy parts of the world, those factors then translate into uh, major uh, migration patterns, which create other kinds of major stresses. So I think that the pressure to act is going to get greater and greater. I actually believe that the rich countries are going to move much more aggressively along the lines of bluntly wealth transfer to the poor countries for achieving uh, both goals. How's it gonna happen? First and foremost, will be a considerable expansion of renewables. Uh, wind and solar, I would include hydro in Africa as controversial, but major hydro uh, opportunities we all know. I think in the United States, by the way, by 2030, we could have a tripling of wind, a quadrupling of solar, but there will also be continuing increased recognition that weather-dependent resources leave you vulnerable to weather. <laughs> that never happens uh, in Texas. <laughs> despite all the wind in Texas, there are 90 days a year, it's a quarter of the year, with essentially no wind. The solar insulation is double in the summer what it is in the winter. Low latitude. We have to design the systems around uh, resilience, risk management, uh, recognizing if we are going to go to uh, weather-dependent resources, we better damn well solve things like long-duration storage. I think Ernie made a really good point that it's the, it's, that these new resources are weather dependent themselves. Weather plays out in more than one way when the wind doesn't blow. The UK has made a big commitment to offshore wind. It's a one quarter of their electric capacity, I believe. But uh, in the autumn of 2021, when they had their energy crisis, one of the reasons was the wind didn't blow. And suddenly they had to use gas. And you know what? They even had to start up coal plants that they hadn't used. So that question that Ernie said of reliability and resilience of your electric power system as you get more electrified, as you have electric cars on the road, becomes more important. And that's why you need a balanced system. Right, right. And, 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 and so that's that tension between reliability, affordability, and, and clean, emissions clean, is real. How can we improve that? How can we improve that conversation so that it's not a, it's not a either you're clean or you're reliable and affordable? First of all, we don't want to get deflected from the idea that, you know, we can solve this. We can have uh, uh, very, very low greenhouse gas emissions, CO2 emissions, uh, and, uh, and provide reliable, resilient power. But to do so, we have to uh, keep a focus on those emissions and understand that every tool in the toolbox has to be used mm -hmm. and will be used unless we put up artificial barriers in different ways in different regions. Frankly, I think that those who want to narrow the solution space are working against our shared goals of a, of a clean energy transition. I, that's very well said. So, yeah. I mean, it is, it is a question, it's still gonna be an energy mix, it's just gonna be a different mix, and sometimes lose sight of it. Technologist Ernie ran the uh, 
Energy Initiative at MIT and then as Secretary of Energy focused on, of course, where the real answers are going to come from technology. There's 60 groups working in the United States on advanced nuclear power. How mm -hmm. many people know that 60 groups in the United mm -hmm. States are working advanced nuclear power? Things are going to come along as a surprise. Hydrogen wasn't really on the agenda a couple of years ago. Now it's a big deal. It'll be very interesting to think what's going to be on the agenda that we don't quite see today, mm -hmm. 10 years from now, that will change the discussion just as shale changed the discussion or just as the plummeting cost of solar changed the discussion. Mm -hmm. And I think what's worth adding is that there has never been so much innovation in the nuclear realm than we have today. And it is remarkable how the private sector financing led that uh, innovation It takes change. a certain degree of courage after everything that's been said and done about nuclear in this country to say, let's go out and... Right. What you mean is it takes a lot of courage. <laughs> uh, and I would agree with that. But and, now... And some money. And no, and now uh, the, the government, the Department of Energy, the government, the Congress uh, have been moving in the last uh, few years in terms of public-private partnership uh, on nuclear fission technology. And now we're seeing the beginning of that in nuclear fusion technology. There have been several nuclear fusion companies supported with private funding mm -hmm. and have made enormous progress to the point where the scientific challenges of fusion may be resolved in this, in this decade. Mm -hmm. Now, I can't say here today 100% that's going to work, right. but that's an example, a total game changer uh, that could be very much uh, yeah. something that we'll understand within, say, five years. So let me come back to the energy mix and we'll kind of wrap this up. How do you see this, these, this global energy mix and the different geopolitical dynamics playing out to address the dual challenge? Affordable, reliable energy, improved environment. Well, I think that um, I think the key word is energy mix. The, the mix will shift. The balance will shift. Uh, there'll be competition among energy resources. Which way you go? I think technology will come along and deliver surprises along that way. What's really important is to keep an open mind and not get locked into one set of views as this is the way and that's the only way. Adjust to understand other people have other points of view and other needs, and also that things will change. The facts on the ground will change, and we have to continue to think uh, in an open-minded way about the future. And by the way, if, we, if we're open-minded, we'll all get along better, too. Yeah. <laughs> I think we see in front of us uh, an array of options uh, that will be mix and match in different ways in different places. So today, I mean, again, wind, solar, uh, some degree of storage uh, with that, uh, hydro, geothermal, uh, nuclear uh, uh, fission, uh, natural gas will play an important role. In particular, carbon capture and sequestration will come in with gas and maybe with coal uh, as well. And we may have the, quotes, surprise, something like fusion. So, you and know, efficiency. What, uh, oh, well, no, no, a, efficiency yeah. across the board. Right. Uh, of course, right. for everything. And, right. and efficiency, by the way, uh, especially in the nearer term, is going to be very, very important in the transportation sector and the building sector, um, uh, but across the board. But the point there is, you can see, to, to go to this deep decarbonization uh, in the electricity sector, the reality is we do have a lot of options. The fuel situation is far more murky. Uh, I mean, today there is no doubt about the hydrogen discussion being the dominant one, and that may very well be the solution. Alcohol fuels like ethanol, which we could do more with, right? We have so-called electrofuels. We have many, many more options than are being discussed. And, uh, and let's, well, let's develop yeah, them all. There's a lot of pessimism and uh, apocalypse and disaster impending. And, you know, maybe some of that is necessary to motivate people and get attention, you know. But I think actually, when you look at what's, look at the amount of effort and scientific talent and research and everything that's going into this, uh, that actually, uh, I think there's grounds, this is shocking, to be optimistic. Yeah. I think there's going to be a widening array of choices. So I think uh, two qualities that would really help in this discussion. One 
is being open-minded, mm -hmm. and two, actually being optimistic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Rising U.S. shale oil production has changed geopolitics, reducing our dependence on and changing our political dialogue with the Middle East. Meanwhile, rising energy consumption, particularly in Asia, will see global oil demand grow into the 2030s. After that, carbon reduction policies may slow demand. Emerging and developing areas like Africa and India desperately need energy for their growing populations. They'll focus mostly on expanding grid electricity from coal, gas, and hydro, and modern cooking fuels that produce less particulate air pollution. There and around the world, emerging technologies may disrupt energy markets. We need to keep an open mind to new technologies and new ideas, and to different energy mixes geopolitically. Energy Switch is executive produced by Scott Tinker and produced and directed by Harry Lynch. Sophie Byard is the assistant producer and researcher. Editors are Ginny Patrick, Yusef Swachina, and Jackie Kunzler. Matt Aslanian does the sound. Energy Switch is produced by Arcos Films for the Switch Energy Alliance with support from Microsoft and the University of Texas at Austin.